You're listening to the Mind Over Finger podcast, episode number 54. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast, discussions on mindful music making, efficient practice, and building a purposeful career. And now your host, Dr. Renee Paul Gauthier. Hi everyone, I hope you're doing great. Today I'm really excited to have legendary pianist Jerome Lowenthal for you on the show. Jerry's been a prominent presence in the international piano world for more than 60 years. A student of three legendary musicians, William Capel, Edward Stuerman, and Alfred Cortot, he's performed a voluminous and varied repertoire that includes more than 63 different concerti with many of the world's greatest conductors, and he's appeared with major orchestras in the U.S., including Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, Los Angeles, Pittsburgh, San Francisco, National, Baltimore, Cleveland, St. Louis, and Minnesota. He's premiered solo music by Rockberg, Capana, Reese, and Roram's Piano Concerto No. 3, and he's played duo recitals with great artists including Itzhak Perlman, Ranit Amir, and Ursula Oppens, whom you heard last week on the podcast. Jerry's been a Juilliard faculty member since 1991. He's a regular participant in chamber music festivals across the U.S., and he teaches at the renowned Music Academy of the West in Santa Barbara in the summer, where I met him years ago when I was a student there. He's received prizes in international competitions in Brussels, Bolzano, and Darmstadt, and has made numerous recordings of solo, concerto, and chamber music repertoire. Jerry was in Chicago a few weeks ago, performing, speaking, and leading a masterclass at the Chicago Piano Fest at Roosevelt University, and he was incredibly gracious to take some time in his hectic schedule to sit down with me and answer some questions. Through his incredible story, Jerry talks to us about how the varied sources of influence he was exposed to as a young musician led him to search within himself and find his own artistic voice, how he helps students do the same today, and he gives out wonderful wisdom and advice for young musicians. There's so much to learn and so much inspiration to be found in his journey, and I'm so happy I had the chance to chat with him. I hope you love this conversation with Jerome Lowenthal. Let's go to the show. Jerome Lowenthal, I think that we can say that your career, both as a solo artist and a pedagogue, have shaped the pianistic landscape of today. So if that's okay with you, I'd love to hear in your own words how that artistic path has unfolded. How has it unfolded? Well, uh, it began with uh, childhood studies, and I was very unfortunate, or perhaps very fortunate, in having many different teachers. Certainly at the time I thought I was unfortunate. Somehow every time I came to a teacher, something awful happened. Uh, uh, the teacher died or, or, or was fired. Or, and um, uh, so that meant that I got many different points of view. And um, that was distressing to me when I was growing up and into my 20s. But now I have to say... It was really a great help. I wouldn't recommend it to people, but the fact is that it, it, it has given me a, a, a way of looking at things that are uh, not limited by, by the single teacher uh, uh, approach. Um, I started with a uh, Mrs. Sharp at the Ornstein School of Music in Philadelphia. And um, after a half year, I was four and a half when I started. And uh, after a half year, my parents decided that I should be moved. And um, so I um, I auditioned for Mr. Saperton, who was the head of the piano department at the Curtis Institute. He said that I was too young for Curtis, but that he would be happy to 
have me study under his supervision with his assistant, Miss Bloom. And um, of course, I couldn't go to public school, and there should be tutors and so forth. Very uh, ambitious program, not in any way possible, let alone desirable. Um, there's a, a, a side history of Miss Bloom, whom I never met at the time, but uh, many years later, well, I'll, 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 I'll come back to this in a second. Um, my parents told Mr. Saperton that they couldn't afford such a program, and he said, well, in that case, he recommended a school uh, where one could get a good education for very little money, the Settlement Music School in Philadelphia, which still exists, by the way. And um, so I went there. And um, many years later, I gave a benefit recital for them. And the publicist, a woman named Kathy Sokoloff, asked me if I would write to her how I'd come to the, the settlement school. And I emailed her the story which I just told you, as I told it, as I told you. And um, she answered saying she was very happy with that. She said, by the way, do you know that Miss Bloom is my mother, Eleanor Sokoloff? Eleanor Sokoloff, the very famous uh, piano teacher of the Curtis Institute, who is now 105 and still teaching uh, very Anyway, I went to the settlement school, and there I had a wonderful teacher, um, but I was deemed too talented to remain with just an ordinary teacher, and um, a, a uh, brilliant European refugee named Joseph Schwartz or Schwartz was brought into the school and uh, I started studying with him. That was exciting and he was a great friend of Albert Einstein and at that time Einstein became honorary president of the board of directors. There was a concert for Einstein. I played for him. That is autograph and so forth. Um, people always like to hear about Einstein. <laughs> Uh, I was seven at that time. Um, but then the head of the settlement music school decided that he had enough of Mr. Schwartz, and so he fired him and engaged another European refugee, Emile Bohm. And Monsieur Bohm, from whom I learned how to count to six in French, uh, because he un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq, six. Uh, um, but he lasted only a year, and then there was another French person named Mademoiselle Legault or Madame Legault. And uh, then Irma Volpe, who was um, the wife at the time of the rather celebrated uh, composer, Stefan Volpe. Then things had happened. My father had died and my mother decided to move. And so my next teacher was a lovely, lovely lady named Dorothea Ortmann, the daughter of a celebrated pedagogue named Otto Ortmann. Um, I loved Miss Ortmann, but uh, uh, my mother moved back to Philadelphia, and so, and so I started to feel very unhappy with the whole situation. And, um, and then I played, as one does at a family party, you know, uh, uh, um, I don't know what I played, but a woman came to my mother and said, um, would you like to meet a man who helps young pianists, young musicians? The answer was a very definite yes. And so I was introduced to my future patron, Mr. Frederick Mann. Mr. Mann, whose granddaughter came to the concert last night uh, in, here in Chicago. Mr. Mann, uh, I'm sure you don't know his name, but he was, uh, he, he's been dead for some years now. Uh, he was a very famous figure uh, in Philadelphia. Everybody knew his name, and not just in Philadelphia. He was a, um, he was a businessman, but he was also a political figure, and um, he was a philanthropist, and um, the concert hall in Tel Aviv was named after him, the Frederick Mann Auditorium. It's now gone to somebody with 
more money, but but um, but it was for, for the first fifty years, Frederick, the Frederick Mann Auditorium, and um, so I met Mr. Mann, and um, my life changed very much. Um, Mr. Mann's style of living was quite different from the restricted, even repressed, widow's household in in which I was growing up in. Uh, Mr. Mann's household was rather wild, and the paintings on the wall were by Modigliani and Matisse and Picasso and Soutin and Chagall. And um, there were pictures of artists also. Um, Mr. Mann bounded into the room where my mother and I were sitting, and he pointed to a picture on his piano of a young man uh, looking dreamily out, and it was inscribed to Sylvia and Fred Mann, with, uh, et cetera. And um, he said, he had a very rough voice. He said, uh, that's Willie Capel. He's the best American pianist. He's my protege. I didn't know the name William Capel. He was indeed the best American pianist. He was one of the great. Uh, pianist of, of the uh, middle of the 20th century. He died at 31. He did not come into my life at that time, but I have a reason for telling that story. Anyway, Mr. Mann took me to Isabella van Gerova, a famous teacher who taught me how to produce sound with the drop of a wrist, but very little else. I don't mean that she wasn't a wonderful musician, but that Everything was concentrated on the method. And the method, of course, like all methods, was both limited and, and falsifying, because if you think of making music in terms of, of a movement, you're, you're already on the wrong track. That's my opinion. So, um, so I studied with her for a year, but then Mr. Mann was dissatisfied, and uh, he called me up and asked me to come to the house, and he'd invited Madame Samaroff for dinner. Madame Samaroff was perhaps the most famous piano pedagogue in the United States at the time. She, she was Samaroff Stokowski. She'd been married to Leopold Stokowski, and um, she was an angel, at least I thought so. And uh, uh, she was very generous, and I became her her student, and I was very happy, and uh, uh, a, um, a new world opened to me, and, and um, that uh, lasted only less than half a year because she died. And um, then I studied with her former assistant for a while, and I wasn't very happy. But then I met William Capel, um, this young man, and... Um, he agreed to take me on as uh, his student. Now, at this point, I was um, 18 years old. I was at the University of Pennsylvania as a student, majoring in French literature, by the way. And um, so I went to New York for lessons. Capel was very busy touring, but... Um, he managed to give me a great many lessons. He was a very inspiring, very scary teacher. Scary because he wanted things to be well played, and he wasn't generous if he didn't like it, but wonderfully generous if he did like it, and generally wonderfully generous. And um, so I, I studied with him for three years while I was continuing at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, then he was killed in an airplane crash. And, and um, then I thought about giving up music, actually, giving up piano, you know. And I realized I couldn't. So I um, put a few strings together, and I moved to New York. And I, uh, I, Capel had been 
hired to teach at the Juilliard School. He never did because that would have happened after his plane crash. But uh, I went to the Juilliard School, and there I studied with a very different man, um, a great musician, uh, a, a, a Polish pianist from the from the Viennese school, Edward Steuermann. And um, Steuermann was actually marvelous, and I studied with him for three years. And then really I had enough of teachers. <laughs> but I needed a deferment from the United States Army because there was a draft at that time. So I applied to um, for the Fulbright Commission, and I received a, a grant to study in Paris for a year. Um, I was going to study with Marguerite Long, the famous Marguerite Long. And, um, but first, I went to a, um, uh, a competition, the Buzoni competition. And um, I won second prize. The first prize winner was a 16-year-old Argentine girl named Marta Argerich. And um, no one could have denied her the first prize. She is arguably the world's greatest pianist. However, there was, uh, on the jury, there was a man named Nikita Magalov who came to me and said um, he was interested in my playing. He said, whom are you going to study with in Paris? I said, with Marguerite Long. He said, what do you want to work with that old bag for? He said, uh, if you come to Geneva with me, I'll introduce you to Alfred Cortot. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't turn that down, so I went and played for Cortot, and he welcomed me very generously as his student at the École Normale de Musique in, in Paris. He lived in Lausanne, but he um, uh, but he came to Paris, you know. Um, so I spent a wonderful year. I mean, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful in retrospect, because most of the time I was very unhappy, as um, people that age often are, I think. And um, I could have gotten a renewal of my f fellowship, but uh, I, uh, I, wanted to, I was planning to get married. My girlfriend, whom I'd met at Juilliard, um, had come to Paris, and she'd then gone back to her native Haifa, and I was planning to go to Israel, get married, and then go back to live in Paris for the rest of my life. So uh, I went to, uh, to Israel, and uh, I met her family and her very interesting mother, who was a violinist, hearing my plan, said, what are you going to live on? Well, I didn't really know. And I always remember this when I speak to young people. I was by this time 26 years old. And I had some vague possibilities, but I really didn't have the money to support us. And then my future mother-in-law, without telling me that she was doing it, arranged for me to get a, a, a position teaching in Jerusalem. So... I went to Jerusalem, and my uh, my future wife did also, uh, um, and we we were married a year later. But um, I, I I in Israel I played a great deal. Um, Mr. Mann, my patron, I've left him out of the story for a while, but uh, he he was very influential in everything I did, and um, <clears throat> and he had a lot of connections which helped me. So. <clears throat> um, I immediately was soloist with the Israel Philharmonic, and I played all over the place. And um, uh, I was, I was uh, something new to uh, Jerusalem sensibilities, and, and be, Jerusalem in those days, in fact, t today still, is a very uh, stuffy, old-fashioned place, and and um, um, and. I came with uh, with the spirit of a uh, radical American, and and um, it worked very well. So we were there for three years, 
I, um, the first year, uh, not married, and then and then we were married, and um, and then we decided for various reasons to go back to the United States, and meanwhile I'd made all sorts of connections playing, and one of them was with uh, the conductor Joseph Cripps, with whom I had played the Bartok Second Concerto in um, in Israel, and. He engaged me to play the Bartok Second in New York with the New York Philharmonic, and um, um, that sort of launched me along with uh, a recital that I gave, and and, uh, and then uh, thanks to my talent and my connections, both of them working together, I um, played with myriad or orchestras, and I, I I always said yes. To repertoire, so I ended up playing in playing over sixty different concerti with orchestra, and um, and to answer your question in a different way, pianistically, the the different exposures that I'd had made it possible for me to ask myself, well, how do I think? one should play piano, and, and how do I think one should make music? And uh, this was very helpful to me. And it's also very helpful as a teacher, because I've thought about these things, and, and yeah, as well as doing them. Have I answered the question? You've not only answered the question, but you've also anticipated future questions oh, I, I have. In a previous of episode of the podcast, I was talking with David Jalbert, and he was telling us about how influential you were in helping him discover and explore his own authentic voice. So my question, one of my questions for you was going to be about that and how, um, how can a young pianist or a young musician find these authentic voice? Because we go to teachers, we, we try to please them, we try to execute in ways that we think will either please the public or please the critics, or sometimes we try to really achieve an outside goal. But how can the young musician go about finding his or her own artistic voice? Well, I'll answer... In a sideways way, I'm in a way I'm answering a different question, but a related question. The question: How do you express yourself as an individual artistically, and at the same time follow the score meticulously? So my answer is a story by uh, Jorge Luis Borges. Uh, you, do you know Borges? It's, uh, he was a um, an Argentine writer who wrote short, densely philosophical fictions. And um, one of them is called Pierre Menard, the author of Don Quixote. And um, it's about a mythical, of course, phys fictitious, of course, um, a French writer from the uh, the fin de siècle the, and, the, the, and the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and his, his culture is explored rather fully by, by Borges. And he has a project. The project is to rewrite two chapters of Don Quixote, Cervantes' masterpiece. He's going to rewrite these chapters without changing anything, not even a dot of punctuation. But by being himself and not a 17th century Hidalgo, he's going to give a new meaning to every word. Now, this is a kind of a parable, of course, and, and uh, I interpret it as a parable for performing also. Do we follow the instructions of the composer? With certain exceptions, yes. As closely as we can. 
and we try to find ourselves in those instructions. Now, it's, it's hard for me to answer your question, how do I do something for other people? Because it's the other people who, who m maybe could answer better. Mm -hmm. But I, th what I do is to direct the uh, direct student's attention to the score, bringing with my my suggestions, cultural suggestions that that they may or may not be conversant with, and some of them really don't don't know Western culture so well. They don't know. European history so well. Sometimes that matters. So that's of course not true with David Gerber, but but um, so I I direct the student's attention to the score, and I try to encourage them to have a way of understanding why the score is the way it is. Why does a composer use this harmony and not that harmony? Why does Beethoven have a uh, subito piano after a crescendo? What does that represent? What does that represent that one can identify with? So, to take that example, Beethoven's late crescendi followed by subito pianos. That's a stylistic uh, mark. It's, you can always recognize the, that. And it's a kind of a temperamental thing. And um, we all can identify with that kind of temperament, even if we don't normally have it. It's the sudden eruption of excitement and then getting getting a hold of it. And so in the process of identifying with Beethoven, we find out something about ourselves in the same way that a composer does. Beethoven's The Slow Movement for Opus 10 Number 3 is famously tragic, adagio e mesto. And um, it was composed around the same time as when he wrote the Heiligenstadt testimony in which he expressed his despair over losing his hearing and, and uh, his desire to kill himself. And that comparison, that, 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 that connection is always, is always made. But in making that connection, one has to m mention that in the same sonata, he composed one of his most humorous compositions ever in the rondo. So what does that mean? Does that mean that he wasn't unhappy? Well, not at all. But it means that he knew how to channel his, his unhappiness into this adagio e mesto, and at the same time, he knew how to channel a different mood into his rondo. Mm -hmm. And we as performers have to do the same thing. And we do that through the markings of the, uh, of the composer. So I think that's, that's a kind of an answer to your, to your question. You find your own voice by identifying with the composer and taking what, what he has expressed and finding its equivalent in your own psyche. This is a great answer. And it goes back to what you mentioned when you were talking about your journey, that you were asking yourselves those questions. That's right. Yes. Jerry, what would be some advice that would, you would give to uh, young musicians out there? Well, take the high road. <laughs> 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 uh, 
one thing which troubles some young people and not others is that they they don't feel like practicing or they they don't feel in the mood and i would say try to find a routine for your practice and practice even if you're not in the mood in the routine because the mood may come upon you and if you're out doing something else it won't get into the into the piano when students as happens every once in a while suddenly burst into the into tears in a lesson i don't mean that it happens very often but it, it has happened you know and um, i say what's the trouble uh, well i broke up with my whatever <laughs> whatever gender you you like and uh, without being unsympathetic i say look there are always personal problems in life they just t- take different forms mm-hmm. and the important thing is just to continue with what you're doing at the piano mm-hmm. whether you're unhappy or happy find find expression in your happiness find release but in any case ma- make your your relationship to your instrument a a, a stable part of, of of your life and um, what else other advice can I give well of course play as well as you can which means of course play as expressively as meaningfully as you can I think that um, when one approaches a piece one should have immediately in mind what kind of sound one wants to produce and um to find the the technique which will will, will produce that sound rather than starting with a movement as i said before mm-hmm. and trying to procrustes bed like that movement onto the or the, the, that the, the music into the movement uh more specifically a lot of people play very well but they make the same physical movement for every beat it goes in out in out in out that affects the phrasing start with the phrasing think how do you want the phrase to be and then instead of going in out in out go in out in out in you see we were talking earlier one thing about flexibility if you're at the beginning of a career sometimes it's not always easy to know what directions to go so someone who's looking at a career ahead of them right perseverance is is my message actually i've known many many wonderfully gifted young musicians who have uh, thought well but maybe i should do this maybe they may be right people get drawn into cults of different sorts and um their cults may be fine or they may be not but they keep you from practicing and um if you can just always have this guiding light of seeking excellence in your playing then you will you will become an artist you will be an artist professional questions they they have to be dealt with uh, one by one and then you know everybody's circumstances are different mm-hmm. money is not available to everybody but sometimes you can do things that you think you can't do that's how in my in my life story i didn't really elaborate on this but i was uh, after capel was killed i was uh, i was wildly unhappy and and i was sort of stuck in philadelphia and i'd always felt i couldn't move because i i had no money at all and then i wanted to move sufficiently that i did something very simple 
I went to my patron. I'd never done this, you see, and said, will you support me if I go to New York? Now, he didn't throw money at me, you know, but, but he gave me enough that I was able to do that. And of course, tuition in those days at the Juilliard School was nothing. And I had a very large scholarship. But um, sometimes you can do things mm -hmm. that you want to. Sometimes you can't. I mean, I, uh, and everybody has to have a sense of him or herself, I guess. And you, if you want something badly enough, you ask for help. And That's right. Sometimes it will That's show right. up. That's right. That's right. Jerry, thank you so much for this gift of your time. I uh, truly my, appreciate it. My pleasure to talk to you. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoy this chat with Jerome Lowenthal. I think that what he said about developing our own inner voice through our personal interpretation of what is in the score and how it fits in the historical and cultural context is so important, crucial. Approaching things this way, I think, encourages us to develop some of the best qualities a musician could have. Curiosity for more knowledge and understanding reverence for our history, and a fearless imagination. And that's definitely something I'd like to discuss with him again, and with future guests as well, of course. I also love what he says about developing a routine and not letting our practicing be influenced too much by our mood of the moment, but rather to welcome the instrument as part of our life. Yes, for sure, we can channel our emotions through our instrument in our practice, but we should not let them dictate our practice regimen. And that resonates with what Ursula Oppens was talking about last week. And if you've missed that episode, it's so full of incredible, actionable wisdom. And I strongly recommend you catch it now. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider sharing with a friend that you think might benefit from our conversation. And let me know what your favorite takeaways from the episode were by taking a screenshot, sharing on Instagram, and tagging me. I'm Mind Over Finger. As always, you can find the show notes for this episode, more information about Ursula, and more resources on mindful and deliberate practice at mindoverfinger.com. You can also join my Facebook tribe at facebook.com slash groups slash mindoverfinger tribe, where I pop in once a week for live videos answering your questions. And if you're looking for the perfect tool to start applying more mindfulness and patience in your practice, sign up for my newsletter to get your free guide to a super productive practice using the metronome. You can find that at mindoverfinger.com or click the link in the show notes. This guide is the ideal entry point to help you learn faster and achieve more efficiency in your practice. It's filled with tips and tricks on how to use that wonderful tool better and it's going to take your practicing and your playing to new heights. One more thing I want to mention, I have some exciting news about the website. Many of you contact me to ask about the many tools I use, the books I like, as well as all of those awesome books and resources mentioned by all the guests on the podcast. So I've created a resource page on the website where you can find all of this, my favorite websites, books, CDs, as well as the other podcasts I like to listen to. And you can find this at mindoverfinger.com slash resources. So I really hope you check it out. I'll have a link in the show notes for you as well as on Instagram. Before I sign off, I want to thank Winston Choi, Associate Professor of Piano at Roosevelt University, for facilitating my interviews with both Jerry Lowenthal and Ursula Oppens. Again, thank you and a bientôt.